Hello, I'm Tom Bailey, and in today's Speaker Stories episode, I'll be getting to know Alex Staniforth, who is a record-breaking adventurer, ultra runner, author, and mental health activist. So Alex, hello, and a very warm welcome to today's episode. Hi, Tom. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. And just out of interest for, for me and everyone listening, whereabouts are you in the world right now? Um, I'm at home in Skelsma, which is just north of Candle in the Lake District. Um, so I'm looking out to the hills and it's not raining for a moment. So, yeah, it's a, wow. a good Friday. That's amazing. Incredible. And especially with all of the the running and the, the outdoor adventures that you do. That's the perfect place in the world to live. It's not well, bad. It's good. <laughs> thank you so much for sharing. And I know that you're not somebody to shy away from a challenge. And in fact, went from having a lifelong stammer to now being an international motivational speaker. So for me, I really want to find out about your journey as a speaker from those early beginnings up to where you are today. So where shall we begin? What's your earliest memory of having to deliver a presentation? Good question. Um, It feels like a long time ago, relatively speaking. Um, I'm 27, so it probably isn't that long ago. Mm -hmm. Um, But I've, yeah, I've had a stammer ever since I've been able to speak. So speaking in front of an audience or even on the phone has just been a complete nightmare for me. Mm -hmm. You You know, I even smashed up phones at home because I've been unable to say my name or say thank you or anything so it's been a constant challenge and I still live with that today um I was lucky enough to 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 be a torchbearer in the Olympics in 2012 um Mm -hmm. and that led me to be invited by my old primary school to go and speak to the students about some experience suddenly I had this unique opportunity to talk Mm -hmm. about now naturally when they asked me I, I I couldn't see it that even being possible how on earth am I going to speak in front of 200 kids and kids can be a pretty unforgiving audience yeah um but I think having that opportunity as a torchbearer had started to make me realise, you know, what happens when we say yes to things. And I started to push myself to go outside of my comfort zone and to embrace all the opportunities that brought. So I said yes, and I was utterly terrified. Mm-hmm. But I turned upon the day in my Olympic torchbearer outfit, and suddenly I found, quite interestingly, that speaking in front of a room full of people was a lot easier than it would be face-to-face or wow. on a Zoom call or on the phone mm-hmm. call. And I loved it. I got a buzz out of that. And the thought that I could make a difference and inspire young people was phenomenal. And from then on, I kept on pushing myself. I kept wanting to do more and more of it. And I guess uh, that's the initial spark to where we are today. I love that. And and I guess it's very much the same with, with overcoming lots of different fears and challenges is we build up this big picture of how it is going to, how I'm going to fail or how I'm going to be embarrassed or how I'm going to make a mess of the whole thing. But until you actually go and do it and try and, and you know experience it, you just will never know. So it is worth just getting outside your comfort zone and really pushing yourself, isn't it, to to achieve that goal? Yeah, and I think it doesn't have to be big. You know, mm. I started, I literally threw myself in the deep end, which I mm-hmm. have a habit of doing. And, yeah. and sometimes that's good because you really raise your bar, but it could just be a small event speaking in front of a few friends or 10 people, some colleagues. Um, any opportunity, I think it's about taking the first step and playing to your strengths you know if you're talking about something you're passionate about then you're halfway there yeah and you know I don't regret doing that at all because it's given me the the best job in the world excellent great I love that story and I guess if you you think where you are now and you think back to Alex on that stage front of 200 students what what's the one piece of advice that you'd give to him right now to help him get prepared for that situation um probably advice that I still use today is to be prepared to Mm -hmm. practice to not be afraid of showing your authentic self yeah that doesn't mean turning up and winging it you know and that's a mistake that i've i have made before and don't want to make again Mm -hmm. but i think it's about um trusting your expertise and the value that you can give to people the challenging part of being a speaker is sometimes you can't measure or see that you know you could plant a seed in somebody's mind that won't evolve for many many years but i think it's not to underestimate the value you're having and to you know turn up as yourself um yeah. I think more recently I kind of maybe fallen into the trap of trying to match up to what other speakers are doing and wanting to be as successful and as busy as they are and it's easy to go off your own path and to you know not stay in your own lane so I think don't be afraid to show who you really are and if I if I stand on a stage people can connect and relate to that people yeah. want to relate to people to emotions to feelings not just to think oh well I couldn't possibly do that yeah that's really important and you know it, it's not to compare but when I first thought about becoming a speaker I had a, a Midlands Birmingham accent and I thought 
I can't be a public speaker because I've got this Birmingham accent. No one's going to take me seriously. And so I actually went to pay for a vocal coach to try and change my accent, which was the complete wrong thing to do, uh, especially based on that advice there. It's just be yourself, be authentic, be true to your roots. Uh, and, you know, not everyone has to love you, but a lot of people will as long as you're providing value. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Well, OK, so we, we've kind of talked about where you were, where it began and um, those early days. Now, there's always a transition in the public speaker's life of, of doing that free talk in front of a school audience or a local club to then actually getting paid to speak. So I guess what was that transition point like for you to go from free speaker to paid speaker? What what happened and, and how did you kind of how did you get through that experience? Interesting point. And I think I can't ever say it was planned. You know, mm -hmm. I, I didn't. It was a goal, but I didn't have a plan. Therefore, it wasn't much use. Yeah. Um, but it just kind of happened. And I know a lot of speakers will say that, you know, and I guess I'd come from a background of not understanding the value of these things. I'd always worked in kitchens as a pot washer since I left mm -hmm. school to pay for my expeditions and Everest and things. So I think naturally when I when I was going to Everest in 2014, you know, naturally I had this, I had this point of interest. People wanted to hear about it. Yeah. And we also needed to raise a lot of money in a short time to fund that expedition. Um, and after, after that first school talk, I started being approached by more and more schools to go and speak. And I never charged for it um, until I got an inquiry. Um, well, I kind of emailed Chester Business Club just before my Everest trip, mm -hmm. uh, about basically asking for some money for my trip. And there was this, you know, light bulb moment slash moment of the stars aligning where they said that they said to me, well, actually, our speakers just pulled out of our next dinner. Hmm. Now, they have really top level speakers, the likes of Rand Fines, prime ministers. Yeah, they were going to have uh, Rosie Swale Pope, who's now become a huge inspiration and friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And so they said, if you come speak for us, we'll we'll pay you, you know, for um, speaking and for your expedition. Brilliant. So obviously, I had to say yes. But suddenly, as you know, as as an 18 year old in a suit, I'm turning up to a dinner of a hundred like senior business leaders. Mm. That's where I met my first coach, John, who is still a coach and a good friend. And he taught me everything I needed to know to, to speak well, um, and build that kind of early foundation. Um, but yeah, suddenly when I got offered that much money to speak, um, what they offered me now is, is obviously less than I would probably accept now. Mm -hmm. Um, it suddenly the penny dropped it's like oh this is cool people pay me to do this mm -hmm. you know and it's like can I really add that add that much impact and value but then you realize how much value a speaker can bring to a business to an organization to an event and I think from then on you set your baseline and over the years as I've hopefully got better hopefully got more experience I've been increasing that just to hopefully reflect an increase in value um and you have to really be consistent with that you know yeah. It can seem like a lot of money to people who aren't in the speaking world, but actually you've got to be consistent and know your worth because you've mm -hmm. got to be, um, you can't undermine that because it doesn't only under, undermine, uh, it doesn't only undermine our own worth, but also all the speakers in the industry. Um, and it is the best, you know, it's the best job in the world for sure. Yeah, perfect. I love that. Thinking of your talks today, because obviously you've got, you've had a lot of experiences, you've done a lot of adventures, you know, you've done a lot of ultra running and mar marathons and, you know, Everest, etc. What, how do you get the balance right between between content storytelling inspiration like when you write your talks how do you get that balance and is there a, a science behind it I don't think there's a science there's a lot of practice and a lot of experimentation and and a process you know yeah. and I think everybody's different everybody has their own approach and I think also the client needs their own approach they may mm -hmm. want somebody that wants to focus on storytelling and anecdotes as opposed yeah. to practical tools and strategies and insights I guess as I've got older and more experienced, I have tried to inc include more, you know, practical, actionable tools as well as just yeah. stories. Um, mm -hmm. Stories connect, inspire, but I think you need to leave people with tools. Yeah. Some of those have naturally developed through my challenges that I've learned. Um, I've been doing a lot of research in the areas of resilience and mindset and trying to share some things that I'm learning as well. Um but I think people need to be able to need to relate and take things away. And I think I do try really hard to put myself in the, in the client's brief, in the audience shoes. And mm -hmm. how can I connect being on a mountain in a gale and an avalanche and a disaster, you know, in an earthquake into a, a business boardroom. Yeah. Um, yeah. So story, storytelling is, is the thread throughout, but I really try and connect that back all the time to 
challenges that people might be facing and to the audience so that they can really take something away yeah i love that and, and i guess when you are thinking about becoming a paid speaker it is thinking about how much value can i add to this audience how much can i what's that one thing that they'll take away to implement in their lives that's going to have a massive impact for them as well and i guess that that's where you can start to increase your prices as well the more value you can add to that audience yeah sure Perfect. Well, well, thank you for sharing all of that so far. A um, couple more questions. I think one thing for me that would be interesting to find out about is advice for somebody. So I've got I've got people who are afraid of speaking. I've got aspirational speakers. I've got new speakers. And then I've got experienced speakers. I want to talk to those aspirational and new speakers who may want to one day do this as a career, you know, become a keynote speaker as a career what's what's the best way for them to kind of go about that and what's the core piece of advice that you might give to somebody oh wow um i mean i have a lot of the same questions you know mm -hmm. and i think i've recently realized that i need to play the long game you mm -hmm. know i'm 27 naturally with adventures in everest i want to aim for the top i want to be as good as i possibly can be yeah. you know but i i need to I, I need and want to be in this for a long time yeah. you know and sharing this um sharing that message and a life experience so I think it's about, I guess, playing the long game, you know, being patient with your progress. Mm -hmm. um, and I think knowing your key message, I think it's very easy to be too broad. And at the moment, I'm trying to work out a bit more around what is that core message? You know, yeah. it's got to be something you're passionate about. If you're if you're not, then you've kind of already lost. You've got to be mm -hmm. something that, that, that you can bring. Know what your core proposition is and own that space. Um and I think once you've got that, I think always focus on delivering value, on making a difference first. Yeah. If you focus on the money, the business, I think you're going to end up going off the wrong path. And yeah. you know, maybe I've made the same mistake. I think it's just about knowing the value you, you you can bring and just to own that space, I think is the best advice I could give really. Yeah, I love all that. So that's so important. Um and 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 it kind of links back to something you mentioned earlier as well about having a goal but without a plan so i guess if you are aspiring to become a, a speaker in the long term have that as your goal but you do actually need to create a plan of how you're going to get there as well so that's really important definitely yeah and i think that plan always changes you know mm -hmm. the speaking industry has transformed in the last two and a half years alone and we're yeah. always learning but i think it is that theme around keeping on learning keep speaking to other speakers mm -hmm. what problems can you solve for them yeah. and for the world yeah, perfect. Love that. Great. Well, one last question for me today. If anybody wants to book you as a speaker or find out more about you, where's the best place for them to go? I'd love to hear from them and always happy to share any advice you know, in the speaking world as well. Um, best place is my website, alexstanieford.com. Uh, drop me an email on there. I'm on all the social media channels, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter. You can probably find me quite easily. And um, yeah, feel free to drop me a line. I'd love to help um, inspire and uh, you know, help people to face their own challenges, I suppose. Awesome. Thanks so much, Alex. What I'll do is I'll put a link to all of those links in the show notes um, and so people can just click on that and they can connect with you a little bit further. Thanks, Tom. So thank you again so much for your time today, for adding such great value to, to our audience and also for sharing your story. It's great to be here and thank you for having me, Tom.